Okay, a big imminent assault on Kyiv is the big breaking story right here on India Today's coverage. Day 13 of this crisis. Let's get a, let's get a word in now. Gaurav Savant, our man on the ground in Kyiv, also with us is Olga, Olga uh, Vorozhbit, uh, uh, joining us live from Lviv. Olga, let me quickly come to you first. Uh, what are you making of this, Olga? The, the, the chief of the general staff of the Ukrainian armed forces saying that big assault on Kyiv, which has been expected for many days now, the Russians have regrouped. They're sending their most combat-ready units along with the Wagner groups, along with the, with, with the Kadyrovites for this final assault on Kyiv, which could happen very soon, Olga. Well, uh, what, what I may say as a Ukrainian journalist and also as a Ukrainian citizen is that, uh, well, Ukrainians here are united and they believe in the army. And uh, these 13 days of uh, huge, um, a huge standing of uh, Ukraine um, as a country and of its armed forces just means that um, Ukrainians are ready to repel. If this is the last assault, then they are ready to repel this last assault from, the, from our capital. But is it, what are you hearing through your networks, Olga? Is it, uh, you know, because the reason I ask is because, you know, that military convoy, the attacks on, you know, the, the places very close to Kyiv, like Irpin, Hostomel, uh, the, other, the other satellite areas in the larger Kyiv Oblast area have been increasing over the last 72 hours. So is there a sense on the ground that that big attack on Kyiv is coming? Uh, well, uh, look, I'm not in the army, but yeah. I know that, uh, yeah, I'm a journalist, um, but I know that uh, Ukrainian armed forces, also territorial defense units, they are prepared and they are prepared to, to repel uh, the invasion. Uh, and Ukraine sees that our capital will stand, mm -hmm. will repel. If, the, if this is the last assault, then, then Ukraine will, will repel this last assault. Okay, stay with me, Olga, for a moment. Let's go across to Kyiv, where uh, India Today's Gaurav Savant has been reporting there relentlessly. Uh, Gaurav, big statement coming in from the, uh, you know, the, the headquarters of the general staff of Ukraine. I'm sure you've seen that entire statement. It's pretty specific, Gaurav. It goes into specifics and says, you know, that attack could be happening in hours from now. Shiv... Kyiv is bracing for it. Kyiv has been bracing for it. But now it's imminent. Now it's likely to happen any time is what we are being told as soon as this ceasefire um, lapses. Because this ceasefire is only perhaps the last chance for foreigners to leave this place, for non-combatants to leave this place. And that is why mm -hmm. Russia unilaterally has announced two ceasefires in 48 hours. One yesterday, one today. Once civilians leave, once non-combatants leave, then it's only those who are here to defend Kyiv and those who are here to fight for Kyiv yeah. and then they'll be seen as combatants and this is why the fight in Irpin was intense yesterday. Shiv, the Chechen militia that you talk about, it's, it's fierce, uh, it's fierce and it's feared. Now, this this Chechen militia, now they have carried out certain certain operations in, in Kharkiv and in some other pockets which were which were really drastic um, and they there have also been some other intelligence-based operations that have been carried out in certain other localities mm. by the Spetsnaz. The information we have through the Ukrainian uh, forces is Spetsnaz teams are already inside Kyiv. These Chechen militia are already inside Kyiv and they're targeting even foreigners. Certain foreign media crews have also been targeted on the outskirts of Kiev. The aim is to send out a very stern message, leave Kiev as quickly as possible, and then there will be this, this huge offensive that is expected. Uh, we've seen glimpses of it in Kharkiv, we've seen a trailer of it in Irpin, Ostumil, and in Bucha. Uh, but, you know, as, as one officer was saying, they expect, they expect pockets of Kyiv to be flattened out by air attacks. It started yesterday in terms of uh, those, those big fighter bombers, the Su-34s being used um, to, yeah. to flatten out certain pockets where air defense assets of Kyiv are. Those have been flattened out. Some Those are being targeted. More will be targeted and then the ground forces will move in. That flattened bridge that we were reporting from in, in Irpin yesterday, yeah, we have a bridge laying tanks, BLTs have already come in is what uh, we have been told 
and you have seen pictures of BLTs already in that area. So a bridge can only stall the advance of the Russian forces for a couple of hours. Mm. They have, they were held back by certain logistics problems, but they have now been overcome. Uh, another piece of input that we have been able to receive is that Belarus uh, border has additional troops, only 90 miles to Kiev. They have additional troops and tanks on standby. And this is more than just the 10% WWR or war, war wasted reserves that had been kept uh, for... for uh, sending into an other locality or any other area where resistance may come. So there are more troops that are being committed. There are more militias that are being committed uh, for this operation, not just for the takeover of Kyiv, but also for the control of Kyiv. And yes. some of these vehicles that are coming in uh, also have right police, right control gear, because should there be a civilian protest, then instead of the army, the militia takes over, the right control teams take over. There is a bigger plan that Russia is moving to, according to information that we have been able to glean Shiv. Very, okay, very important. You know, uh, uh, Gaurav has actually, uh, you know, gotten all this information firsthand as well. So uh, it's more credible than anyone else you can you can think of on the ground there. Uh, Olga, uh, it appears to be much more organized. The reason is also because, we, you know, we are sitting here and talking on day 13 of this operation. In the world's eyes, you know, maybe President Putin had wanted this to be a very quick operation. It's already stretched out for many days. The defense of, uh, you know, Ukraine's defense has been something that may have been underestimated, uh, you know, by the Russian forces. So that's one of the reasons why I think that the, the chief of the general staff in Kyiv is saying that the Russians have regrouped. They've used the word regrouped, uh, you know, taking into account these changes on the ground. And now they know a little better... They're trying to get the foreigners out with these ceasefires and that lays the ground for this possible attack, Olga. Well, um, I can, look, I have no information uh, from the Russian side, but yeah. I believe what Ukrainian general um, headquarters say. And uh, of course, if they regroup, they got more strengths. But that uh, also means that Ukrainians prepare. And that also means yes. that while, if the Ukrainian army says this, that we, Ukraine expects um, the support also from outside. Yes. So, um, Ukrainian foreign minister, I know that in the moment when Russia just, uh, just is on the brink to do this last assault, it's probably not the, the time to talk, but the Ukrainian foreign minister was talking about more sanctions. So the more pressure, also from India, uh, yes. which has the, the, those uh, friendship or those relationship, special relationship with Russia. So th that is why this statement is made, in my opinion, as well. So, of course, uh, we are facing unprecedented uh, violation of all international law, uh, in unprecedented fights and unprecedented attacks from the Russian side for all those days. Uh, but yes. uh, of course, if you if you want me as a Ukrainian citizen say that uh, yes, we like uh, th this fight will be last for us. I can't say this just because I, I've seen this for 13 days. How Ukrainians, just ordinary Ukrainians, not only army, but we're united. Mm. Uh, I, I remember uh, this also from previous when when we had uh, also difficult moments also in 2014. How Absolutely. Ukrainians united. So even the special forces with uh, the huge experience as uh, as Wagner Group, as Kadyrovci. By the way, Kadyrovci were and your journalists also said they were present in the Kyiv region already and their violations of the human rights there are just, um, I, I do hope that any uh, international tribunal will also deal with that because this is just horrible. Yes. We hear not only not only what, what they do just with ordinary people, we hear also about rapings from, from their side. So just taking this into consideration, of course, it's a very difficult moment. And I do hope this is the last moment um, and Ukraine wins and this horrible, these horrible two weeks will end up. But um, th this is what I, what I hope and what I think. But of course, Ukraine needs support. And that's why Ukrainian general staff, Ukrainian president yes. are appealing for the world, also to India. And that help hasn't come in yet uh, in any direct manner. There are two things that are happening right now. Great deal of pressure on the Russians in the form of sanctions, uh, you know, in terms of economic actions, trade actions, uh, weapons flowing in from different NATO countries, but no direct action. The air defense, uh, you know, air defense cover, the no-fly zone that Ukraine has been pleading for for the last 10 to 12 days, 
uh, has not happened and there are no signs of it actually uh, becoming a reality anytime soon. But what is that red line? What appears to be that red line before, uh, you know, something drastic happens from the West, which has so far only provided words and promises, remains to be seen. Olga and Gaurav continue to be with me. Uh, our third reporter on the ground, Serhi Mirankov, is with me live from Kiev. Serhi, you've heard uh, what the, 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 the Ukrainian general staff has just said about the regrouping of the Russian forces for uh, what they say is expected to, to be a big final assault or a final assault attempt on the city you're standing in right now. Kiev, Seri, what are you hearing? Good morning, studio. Good morning, India. Good morning. Uh, all, all, everything is right. Yeah, Russian army, Russian army trying to regroup, trying to circle uh, most of the cities like Sumy, Kharkiv, Kiev also, probably Chernigiv. Uh, was heavy fights in uh, and heavy air attack mm -hmm. on Kharkiv on Sumy this night. Uh, night in Kiev uh, looks like was okay, normal, but we have here some several shotgun uh, shooting from the guns, uh, some uh, air force attacks. Right now everything is fine. Uh, it's heavy snow in Kiev, and we hope that this snow will help to our army and will not help to the army of our enemy right now our president uh still in kiev he will stay in kiev till the end till yes. the victory we everybody in ukraine believes in our president in our government uh to all the negotiations we don't trust the russians because they're trying to uh input propaganda in their news hmm. they are uh, sending information about our previous president yanukovych about pro-russian uh parties who are trying to uh, become a new government, but it's impossible for right now. So we are waiting for the force, maybe next part of negotiation, because the previous one uh, didn't bring anything. We don't get a guarantees of the hum uh, hu humanitarian corridors for uh, civilians. So we are waiting for uh, new attacks and for our defending. Uh, Serhi, you know, the, the statement that's been put out by the Ukrainian general staff, uh, you know, also talks about the, the uh, you know the the, the most combat ready russian units who've been able to regroup it also talks about the, the 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 wagner group from luhansk as well as the kadyrovites from chechnya uh, you know some of whom have already been seen in some operations like olga was just mentioning in uh, you know in hostomel and other places uh, uh, what, uh, what would you say about this it's a very specific statement that's come out with all these paramilitary and militia is also being part of the attack. That's what the Ukrainian military is expecting. We got a bad news from Irpin that around 30% of the city is still uh, under the control of Russian troops. And the bad news is that the uh, army of Kadyrov, uh, they are just, just, just getting into, into the houses of people. They are taking their money. They are b behave themselves as the looters, as a crazy looters because they are with the guns, people without heat, energy, without food. They are, it's very hard for them. And the Hadir of army takes the last that they can take from these people. Uh, at the same time, uh, we know and we have uh, proof that uh, foreign foreigners uh, who are, would like to take part in, 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 in this, in defense of Ukraine, in defense of the whole whole normal world uh, are already in in ukraine from the poland from ireland from great britain uh peoples are coming our president just wrote a declares that uh, to come back to call back all our militarians who are taking uh, uh taking part in international uh military operations they are coming back they are quite skilled and we hope that it's also work and uh, it will be useful for our army for our defense uh and for the future of all Ukraine. Serhi, how well defended is Kyiv right now? We've seen airstrikes taking place, uh, you know, very, very close to the city in Irpin, uh, in, uh, in in Hostomel. We've also seen the Brovari, uh, you know, district, which is uh, just just east of Kyiv, I think, if I'm not mistaken, also part of the Kyiv larger area that also has seen some shelling and some missile attacks there. So the, the number of attacks is increasing, even though there's a ceasefire in Kyiv, the number of attacks around the city are increasing, Seri. Yes, they are increasing uh, due to the regrouping of the Russian armies uh, because as the, all, all this area 
uh, are already destroyed. Uh, most of people are evacuated from from that area, mm. so that's why Russian armies are increasing their air attack to increase the panic, to increase uh, the damages. To <laughs> they're here, they are still here, but I think it would not it would not 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 last long, uh, because as I said before, uh, people from all over the world who have who have a military skills they are coming to ukraine to defense mm. all humanity in the world right now okay seri thank you very much for uh, joining me with that update uh, we'll keep coming back to you stay safe uh, 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 the, this is a big update coming in from the general staff there as well olga continue to stay with me if you can please for just a few more minutes uh, gorov uh, gorov uh, speaking about you uh, speaking about the capital city of kiev how well defended is it gorov you know because there can be no match for a, for a for a pair of eyes on the ground. Are you seeing the Ukrainian military uh, progressively better armed since you got there? Because because one of the one of the biggest pleas has been, you know, if you don't impose a no-fly zone, it's only a matter of time before the cities fall, including Kyiv. No matter how well defended we are, if the Russians come in with all their aircraft, with all their cruise missiles. That nothing can stop the Russians unless there's a no-fly zone. But on the ground, is the Ukrainian army, Ukrainian military, are they better defended? They've been depending a lot on those javelin missiles as well. And we understand that large numbers of those have been pouring in. Shiv, spot on on, on the equipment. Two things that they're looking at mm. and looking for. Some they have. Javelin anti-tank guided missiles, Stinger surface-to-air missiles, and unmanned combat aerial vehicles from Turkey. They're actually disruptive technology. That's actually a game changer. If they get more, they say we can defend better. And I have seen some of these weapons and systems with soldiers on ground. Uh, we were given access to a bunker where you had some of this equipment stored. It had just come in and it was being distributed. And it's being distributed very smartly hmm. for the defense of Kiev. Shiv, they have the numbers for now. But can they sustain it unless, un, uh, you know, when there is a relentless attack that becomes an attack that will come in waves and waves and waves. How long will the systems last? How long will they, will they last when the supply access from the West is cut off? Uh, when there is no aerial route to bring in and when there is, um, uh, you know, no no-fly zone being declared. Every poster and banner now, electronic posters in the heart of Kiev, and we've put out some of those images, say, declare no-fly zone now, world, wake up, NATO, wake up. They're saying this to NATO, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but that hasn't happened just as yet. So, point one. Point two, they can defend, they have the will, they have the, they have the stamina, and they have the, tech, they, they have the expertise. For eight years, they've been training with North Atlantic Treaty Organization countries. So, their tactics and training is good, their morale is high, okay. but their systems, their weapons, and the quantities are, are Gaurav, less. Gaurav, so, when stay with a me. relentless attack, when Gaurav, missiles come, me. when aircraft come, this is, uh, then there is a problem. Gaurav, stay with me. I, uh, just bear with me for a moment. I'm joined now by Tatiana Kukareva, live from Moscow. We also have Olga, who continues to be with us. I want to get both these voices for just a moment here on India Today, because this is a big story. We're talking about Kyiv. It's the center of attention right now. Tatiana, the, the Ukrainian chief of the general staff has just talked about Russian forces regrouping and preparing along with Chechnyan and Luhansk militias for a big final assault on Kyiv. How do you see this? Statement coming out from the Ukrainian military headquarters. Um, well, you know, as I've said before, and as I will continue to say, that all statements coming from Kiev uh, have to be divided by two at least normally. Um, it is an ongoing military operation. So um, the point here is that uh, obviously the military does not announce what it's going to do uh, in the middle of a military operation, because that's you know generally not how things are done. Um, so one thing I I would very much like to you know to point out is that you know you're saying Chechen militias, uh, but uh, the the Chechen battalions are very much part of the Russian military because uh, the Chechens are essentially Chechnya is a part of Russia. 
Uh, so it's it's not a militia whatsoever. Uh, those are very well trained uh, troops uh, that make part of our regular army. Um, I'd say that um, you know um, I'm very I'm personally very wary of any warning coming from uh, you know be that Kiev or the United States. Uh, it was just like you know it was with the um, the announcement of the uh, what they called invasion. They announced it for two weeks prior to the the fact actually, uh, but um, I'm not sure we will know about the movement of the Russian troops until it actually happens. Okay, and I would very much warn against um, you know any sort of, because uh, well, for obvious reasons that would be used to kind of try and pressure NATO into something that it simply cannot do. You know, you spoke just now about the, uh, you know, the, the, the declaring of the no flight zone yeah. and the banners in Kiev that say so. But that's the problem, though, isn't it? Um, the fact that uh, for some reason the Ukrainian government uh, told its citizens that NATO is in a position to declare a no-flight zone, when in fact it's not. Uh, okay. You can only declare a no-flight zone over something that you know that is um, that that you consider a place of combat, and you actually go in there. And NATO has said, all oh, for all this time, and even if just if on this issue of the no-fly zone, before, let's just take this one issue at a time. Olga, do you want to respond to Tatiana on the issue of this no-fly zone? She says that the Ukrainian oh, government yeah, is misleading the people on that front. Yeah, I would like to respond yes. also telling that I do hope that Russian television will be the part uh, together with Russian government on the, on the tribunal. But uh, speaking about the no-fly zone, what I would like to say is that Ukrainian government asks not only uh, for NATO to cover our sky, but there is the other option. The other option is to give us more planes. Mm, there are jets and planes which Ukrainian pilots can uh, can use and um, these are former Soviet made uh, planes and they are still um, in the arsenal of, of Poland and, Sco and uh, Poland and Slovakia. Uh, so uh, these countries, uh, as I um, as I know, these countries just need to have uh, some support from NATO for because if they give these planes, uh, these planes, these jets to Ukraine, um, and Ukraine will then be able to, um, uh, to shelter our sky ourselves. So this is the other option. There is also the option which my colleague from Ukraine mentioned with the foreign battalion. So um, um, it's, if, for example, some foreign fighters uh, can come to Ukraine, these are foreign pilots, we also can have uh, the NATO, NATO class or NATO style jets which they will then be able um, uh, to use. And th th this is the, the third way to, to shelter the sky. So, Ta Ta Tatiana, have, would Moscow see, the, see, see those, those other options that Olga is describing also as acts of war? If a aircraft come in from other countries or foreign battalions in Ukraine? Yeah. That's not an act of war. <laughs> how would foreign, they, how battalions, would they foreign battalions are without a doubt, without question, if it's an official <clears throat> battalion sent by a third party, then of course that third party is getting involved in a war. That's not about how Moscow sees it, that's about how this, these things work in general. It's uh, literally, it's not even up to discussion, you know. Uh, although some countries have already authorized for people to, but on their own accord though, you know, if they want to go fight, they, they can. Uh, and that in itself, it's already, you know, it's, it's very worrisome because uh, we know just how many uh, how many people were, to, so, so, were seeking shelter in Europe, uh, you know, back in the days, the terrorists from, from the Chechen Republic uh, that fled after the wars, you know, so those people might potentially join the fight. Uh, in the meantime, if any third party officially authorizes an actual part of their military to come into Ukraine, well, how else would you see it then, if not a participation in a conflict? Ukrainian government doesn't say this, this is not an official part. These are people who are coming here on, on their uh, own will and their own desire to defend democracy and defy the whole free world. This is what is uh, and what, what Ukrainian government is speaking about. This is about the Ukrainian foreign battalion, those people who are already in Ukraine. 
So this is um, the issue. But um, I would like to stop because I just I can't speak now with with Russian journalists and well, what are they doing? Sorry. Um, thank you, uh, India. To Olga, the... just one just one more question. Can I just ask you one more question? I, I I wanted to ask you, Olga, about the ceasefire. I wanted to ask you about the ceasefire while Tatiana is here because the 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 the, the generals the general view from Ukraine from from Ukraine is that. These ceasefires are not actually happening. Like, for example, in Kyiv, yes. even though Russia has announced a ceasefire, the shelling and the missile attacks are still happening. I want you to have your say, and I want Tatiana to respond to that. Olga, you first on the ceasefires. Look on the ceasefires. Um, the the day uh, before before yesterday, the the ceasefire was announced in, in Mariupol, but then no one can get out of there, and the situation is there on the brink of humanitarian catastrophe. Yesterday, the ceasefire was announced, and the family uh, was just killed. Uh, well, foreign journalists were uh, were seeing that and taking pictures. The family with with children. So um, the, the wall also was um, the position, I guess, from the Russian government uh, to announce a ceasefire and that uh, the humanitarian corridor should move to Russia. How those people who are resisting Russia could move to Russia? This is just impossible. Sorry, but what, we're not what, talking what, about what, what, Russia. We're doesn't just like. It. We're but, talking about but civilian population is not is this shelling starts all the time. And uh, when the humanitarian uh, corridor is announced, then the, the either the shelling or shootings, and we have like proofs with videos from not only from Ukrainian correspondents but from foreign correspondents, and that's the main issue with that. But we dr drastically need, we really need uh, humanitarian corridors, um, especially from from Mariupol, from also Kyiv okay. region, where people are saying without electricity, heating, and the, water. The, that, is, that is a general view from Ukraine. Tatiana, do you want to respond to that? That these ceasefires are only on paper; they're not really happening on the ground. Uh, yes, of course. You know, the problem with people on the ground, uh, especially if we're talking about journalists, I'm not quite sure uh, who I'm responding to, um, you know, what's, journalist, what's yeah. the, the, their occupation. But um, the problem with journalists usually is that they can't, you know, it's, it's the general sense of panic that's been being kind of, you know, harvested and, and harnessed in this uh, in this conflict um if we're saying that the ceasefires are not being observed and they are not being observed but they're not being observed by the ukrainian side i'm sorry but if you're a journalist you can't quite say this look this rocket is russian i see it it says it has russian markings on it it's not again not how it works uh, the Russian military yesterday reported, if I'm not mistaken, once 172 cases of that ceasefire. Da uh, Tatiana, being sorry to interrupt violated. you. I'll let you continue your point. I just want to introduce onto our coverage Hannah Shalest. She's editor in chief of Ukraine Analytica. Welcome, Hannah. We were just talking uh, since you've entered right in the middle of the conversation. Just to update you, Tatiana is talking about the you know the war of claims over whether ceasefires are actually being uh, you know being implemented properly. Tatiana, finish your point. You were making. You were saying that the Ukrainians are not following the ceasefire. Go ahead, finish your point. I'll get Anna to respond to you. Of course, um, you know the Russian military has you know has claimed from the very beginning and continues to say that you know the safety of civilians has been the utmost priority. This is what happened in every city that that they uh, took control of. They then. They uh, gave up humanitarian aid straight away. Uh, they, they're doing extensively whatever they can to prevent civilian population from being harmed. And then, uh, you know, for people from, from within those besieged cities to come in and say, look, we're being shelled at, but you don't know who's shelling you. Uh, we see people who get out of Mariupol, civilian people who then go on camera uh, and they say, look, we were fired at by the Ukrainian uh, security forces. Uh, are those people lying? Let's find, let's find out, are Hannah. We, are we going back Hannah, to the this is a big that... claim that's being made. Tatiana from Moscow says that the ceasefire is not being followed by the Ukrainians and the Ukrainian military is firing on people when they try and get out of cities like Mariupol. How would you, how would you respond to Tatiana? Anna? I'm just wondering, uh, do you have Tatiana being delusioned or with the propaganda working for the government? That's nice to see it in Moscow. 
eye in the uh, home and talking about uh, complete uh, nonsense because uh, uh, you can just see uh, the photos and videos from cities of Mariupol, Mykolaiv, or Kherson, or Chernigiv to understand how Russian armed forces are protecting civilians, bombing just uh, uh, the civilian quarters. My uh, best friend from Chernigiv uh, uh, spent uh, uh, her night trying to save her house from the shelling being in the basement, and it'd been just in the middle of the night. From Mariupol, my friends don't have connections with their families for two days, just no mobile connections, nothing, and nobody can evacuate. And it is not Ukrainian journalists who are claiming that the ceasefire is violated. It is the United Nations nations that confirmed yesterday that the roads been mined and the shellings from the Russian side being continued, including, by the way, yesterday videos how the uh, um, rockets being sent from Novorossiysk, just from the Russian territory. And it seems to me that now with the time when we have so many foreign journalists reporting from the territory, when we have so many proofs uh, of uh, uh, videos, not just photos that you can claim that they are photoshopped. When you see all those photos of the destroyed, completely civilian territories, like 211 schools in Ukraine being completely destroyed by the rockets, including cruise missiles. Sorry, but that is, you need to be not just cynical, but the devil advocate to say that uh, Russian armed forces is trying to protect civilians. I'm really wondering what type of the civilians they're trying to protect, considering all those destructions happening exactly in the civilian uh, territories. A uh, few people that uh, Tatiana just claimed that been reporting they left uh, Mariupol and how they are assisted, that's probably a wonderful demonstration of how the movie industry works in the Russian Federation. The Russians tried to stage the same in Kherson town on the south, okay. bringing 40 buses with the civilians from Crimea and making videos. But uh, people in Kherson came with the uh, uh, blue and uh, yellow flags, the national flags of Ukraine. So just to debunk this propaganda and to show that the city of da Kherson... Tatiana, Hannah says it's delusional to say that the Russians are protecting civilians in these ceasefire areas. Respond, Tatiana. Of course she does. And this is a classic, you know, uh, the classic type of, again, propaganda coming out from the Ukrainian side, which we've been listening to this whole time. I'm sorry, I uh, will Look, stop you're saying that somebody came over want from Crimea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. propaganda when we have uh, two million people left the country, destroyed the cities and killed people. Sorry, but that is not the journalism. That is just to give the word to those who support the war and war crimes in the middle of Europe nowadays. Are you done? Are you? Yeah, D yeah Dada, Thank no, you finish your much. point, finish your point. Uh, okay, I, okay, well, Hannah has, you, yeah, finish your point. Either way, we'll try and get Hannah back. Uh, I don't think she's coming back because this is exactly how they behave. You know, it's accusations and then you go, poof, I'm not talking to you anymore, your propaganda. They don't want to listen. They just want for you guys to believe the claims that, oh, look, we're putting in people from Crimea. Oh. It's the world is being observed by satellites right nowadays. If somebody dro drove people in from Crimea, the whole world would have known about it. Everybody would have satellite images. You know that as well as I do. Uh, look, we're talking about the population, even the southeast of Ukraine, that those Russian speaking cities. I've actually been to Kherson. This is where I first encountered that uh, lovely Western Ukrainian uh, nationalism that we've been talking about this whole time, you know, that where you could you could literally get if you encountered people coming in from West Ukraine and they would go there to, you know, to see the sea, you would get beat up just because you're Russian, just because you have a Moscow accent. And, and this is, you know, this is a sad fact of the, of the you know, the relation between the, the Western Ukrainians and even the Eastern Ukrainians. In the meantime, look, uh, those, it's, it's a very simple thing to say, look, this is staged. These people are not real people. This is the difference in the approaches. You know, we're just stating the facts that we get from our side. If we, our journalists, and those are as well, they're not just Russian journalists. You have Indian journalists on the other side as well, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, at least a couple of channels do. Those people who come in and say, look, we were fired at from the Ukrainian side. They're, they're, you know, they're doing everything to prevent us from leaving the city. And that makes sense. 
This is why, you know, some foreign nationals still remain trapped in those cities. You know that they're not being allowed to leave. Okay. Why would they be, again, you're saying that, uh, well, not you, but, the, you know, the, the lovely Ukrainian shouting people uh, are saying that, you know, this is Russian provocation. Russia has prom offered to evacuate yes. those people for so much time. The Russian president has spoken. He's even spoken to the French president in an effort to, uh, to make Kiev let them leave. They're literally using them as a protection, as a guarantee that there's no assault on the city. Although, again, if there should there have been an assault on the cards, you know that an army is strong. They would have gone in already if they didn't want to protect civilian population. And why stay outside? You just bomb the city from upstairs and you destroy it. And then you control it. It's easy. Killing people is very easy in this in this uh, you know in this scenario. We all know it because we've all seen how it's done by the American army, and trust me, the Russian army is very capable of doing that. I one final. Why would they stay outside the cities? Then? Okay, one final question to you, uh, Tatiana. Very specific question: uh, Is the takeover of Kiev imminent? Is it is it going to happen? It's, you know, we're talking on day 13 of this, of this crisis, of this conflict. Is the, you know, is the invasion and the taking over of Kyiv the next big thing that's going to happen on the ground, in your view? Well, look, this is where it gets tricky for me because I'm not a military expert. Mm -hmm. um, again, and this is why I am personally, you know, uh, I am pleading to, uh, you know, to journalists all over the world to to literally stick to the facts. The fact of the matter is that Kiev is surrounded. Uh, whether they're going in or not, I, I'm afraid that's down to the, you know, to the military plan that is in place. In my personal opinion, I don't see it happening just like this because, uh, again, you know, we've seen pictures, uh, we've seen videos of uh, Grad missiles being put in places in the, you know, in a very densely populated area inside Kiev. So there's no way to kind of go in there and avoid civilian casualties. And, uh, you know, end of the day, look at, at the, the both Ukrainians that you've invited here. Uh, you know, they already hate us. We okay. don't need any more civilian casualties. We, we didn't need them to begin with, you know, but the, unfortunately, the eight years of, of brainwashing that the country sustained. I mean, in Kiev, uh, if you would come in, you know, early, even before this whole situation, you could literally read on the, you know, on cars, you know, they put stickers on cars like, you know, like all Russians need to be killed or something, you know. Okay. Like very aggressive anti-Russian slogans that you would read on cars. And there's, you know, uh, again. D Tatiana, if thank you. We're talking about whether they're going to go in. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. We'll I hear you. And we've we'll we, we, that when, yeah, we have all of when, those images on on air as well. And uh, you know, uh, uh, like so few on the ground, India today is reporting the facts. We're reporting what we see. We're in the conflict zone. Uh, we've got uh, we've got military experts on the ground as well. So we report the facts. We're trying to sift through many of the claims being made on both sides. Uh, you know, as you saw in the last twenty minutes, we attempted to have. Uh, you know, a debate here, but uh, emotions are obviously running high between both sides. It's not something we didn't foresee, but we were hoping for some kind of a discussion. But yeah, let's, let's, let, let, let's, let's, we'll try that again in a few hours, maybe. Tatiana, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good to see you uh, for being here on India Today. Thanks very much for that. Day 13, five images representative of the destruction that continues. It's nearly two weeks of this crisis. When is it going to end? Well, the destruction and debris certainly shows no sign of abating anytime soon. Back in 30 seconds, we're taking you live straight back to Kyiv to show you how the city is preparing for what the military headquarters says is the big final Russian offensive. Oh.